And we gather. Why? Because we love Him. You see how easy it is to add to the work to, to God's commandments and make things worse? The Bible says it. God created it all. And if He wants to do it, He can do it. To the average American, the scene before us this morning in Mark's gospel account probably seems a bit strange. Perhaps you are asking, why is there such, such a big deal about the Sabbath? What's the problem? It has to seem strange to Americans and Westerners to see Jesus embattled with the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes over things like the Sabbath when even American Christians by and large see church attendance or the Lord's Day as almost optional. So to see this kind of controversy and confrontation over, over this has got to seem a bit strange if you take the Bible seriously. Unfortunately, I think we're so used to reading these passages uh, and just kind of um, almost mythologizing them to the, to, to the point that we think that the controversies there are trivial uh, or ancient and so they no longer matter and, uh, and we lose the impact, the power, the... the um, the charge that's there in the moment that, quite honestly, it, it held and should continue to hold for us that understand the Bible. You have no doubt noticed that often what seems to be the issue turns out not to be the main issue. We're often led down a wrong path in our thinking or in our actions because we have started with the wrong premise. Perhaps you have put some today with... Uh, some misconceptions. You've come in here and you've thought some things about Christianity or about Jesus, about the Bible. You've come in with maybe some misconceptions and that's leading you or has led you to some wrong uh, ideas or actions about Christianity or Jesus or God or the Bible. This morning, I hope to bring us back to the guiding premise and the North Star of the faith of Jesus Christ. And that is that Jesus is Lord. That's the, the point. That's the, the uh, guiding idea in this passage. Mark is giving us this account. It's a historical account. Uh, and he's giving us this so that we might come and see to, and come to that conclusion. So we start off the, the situation, one of these conflicts that have, uh, scholars have mentioned that in chapter 2 and in the first half of chapter 3 that there are these uh, conflicts. We saw last week that we said, well, you know, I guess in some way, some nuance. It's kind of a conflict, but in reality, it almost seemed more uh, that they were just seeking to understand. But for sake of the point that Mark is making, and I, I agree with that, that Mark is pressing home to us, who is Jesus? And he's demonstrating that in these uh, situations where at least he's being challenged by people uh, around him about who he is and by what authority he's able to do uh, these things. And so today we see another. We see the one here where Jesus' disciples are on a Sabbath day walking through a grain field. And as they go through the grain field, the disciples, no doubt, are, are hungry, the Bible says, and it's harvest season, and so they're grabbing the fruit of the, of the grain and pulling it off, and you rub it in your hands like that so the husk 
will come off, and then you can eat the grain. And that's what they're doing, just handfuls of grain. That's what's happening in here. So we see that Jesus' disciples are being charged with violating the Sabbath. One Sabbath, he says, he, Jesus, was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, or I think the King James says, Behold, listen. It's that kind of idea. Hey, we might say today, Hey, Jesus, why are your disciples not uh, honoring the Sabbath? Why are, your, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath day? Now, for clarity, the Sabbath was the seventh day of the week. We Christians meet on the first. Uh, so that, but God had established the Sabbath in the Old Testament. In fact, I believe it's a creation ordinance that God created in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. So there's the, the um, idea of rest, work six days, rest one. And so, but then, of course, Moses comes along later under the inspiration of God and it gives us the commandments, which says, honor uh, that, that we keep the Sabbath day holy. And so the Jews began to um, do that, but we find out that there were 39, after all of these centuries, 39 scribal laws had been added or surrounded the Sabbath day and keeping it holy. During the time of Jesus, there were 39 of these. These laws controlled everything from how many steps a person could take on the Sabbath day to what constituted genuine work. So you could only travel so far, and they had numbered your steps. If you stepped more than the number, you had now worked and therefore committed a sin and violated the Sabbath. So what's going on? Well, one of these laws forbade harvesting on the Sabbath. Well, of course, that's work. We would agree with that, I guess. But... Normally, what the disciples did here, though, was allowed by the Mosaic Law. Uh, but since they were doing it on the Sabbath, the scribes and Pharisees con constituted it as work. And so, in other words, the Jewish Mosaic Law said that the poor, if they were traveling or in need, we see this in the book of Ruth, they could go to the cornfields or grain fields or whatever, and they could harvest whatever had fallen or what was on the corners or the edges. They couldn't go out with a, a sickle and basically steal another man's harvest. But they could, if they were hungry, take from that. But the, the scribes had extended that uh, that they could not do that on the Sabbath day. So technically at this point, the, the disciples are doing what would have been okay six days a week. But it wasn't okay on the seventh day, the Sabbath day. So they're traveling probably a short distance, and they are hungry, so they take from the grain, and somehow or other, the Pharisees noticed this. Did it happen on multiple occasions? Did they still have it in their hands? You know, some will argue here and say, well, how, what were the Pharisees doing in a grain field? Well, you know, the critics always seem to be <laughs> at the right place at the right moment, amen? Uh, so I don't know about that. It, does, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't hurt the the narrative at all. We know it happened. But there are ways, I mean, that this could have happened without us being critical of the Scriptures. I mean, they could have come out of the grain field with the grain in their hands. 
uh, the Pharisees could have been standing by somewhere and see. I don't think Jesus and his disciples were buried in the middle of the grain field, do you? I doubt it. Why would you do that? They're probably coming along the edge, probably a fairly worn path that the grain field maybe went through the grain field or to the side of the grain field. Uh, There's probably a well-traveled route. You know, when you read these kinds of things from critics, the truth is, what are they looking for? Understanding or a hole in the Bible? See, that's what they're really looking for. They're looking for some way they can say the Bible is inaccurate or that it doesn't make sense or you can't put it together. But we all operate on presuppositions, don't we? You come to the Bible with one thing or another, and that is either you believe it's God's word or you do not. That's your presupposition. Now, I come to the Bible and I believe the Bible is the word of God and it was inspired by God in the original manuscripts. And so when I come to the Bible, I'm not looking for errors. I'm looking for truth. And if there are times when, like this, that I might struggle and say, well, I don't know how that worked out, you know. I mean, and, and sometimes my understanding will catch up with my belief. But sometimes I have to say, well, you know, Lord, I'm not sure exactly how that happened, but I trust you. And so I'm going to, until my understanding catches up with my belief, I'm going to put that on the side. Give you a good example. The long day of Joshua. You know, Joshua fought and the Bible says that the sun did not go down. Now, of course, if you had just a couple of science classes in school uh, and you paid any attention, you realize that, uh, how did that happen? Did the earth stop rotation? I don't know. All I can tell you is this. The Bible says it. God created it all. And if he wants to do it, he can do it. And so I believe that. Absolutely. Now, will I someday understand why or how God did that? I'm sure. But you know what? When I get to heaven and I see Christ and all of those who know him, I don't believe I'm going to be asking about the long day of Joshua. Do you? <laughs> those things aren't going to matter. So I only say that just to encourage you and to challenge you, as we say, we can't start off on the wrong premise and be led to the wrong conclusion. And if we come in and say the Bible is untrustworthy, then nothing I say to you here today would convince you. But if you come to the Bible and say, I believe it is God's word, I want to know truth, I want to know God, I want to be saved, I want... I want my sins forgiven. Don't be surprised when God answers your questions and changes your life. So here, the, the scribes are, and the Pharisees, they're following their 39 uh, traditional scribal laws that have been packed around um, the celebration of the Sabbath day. And God's commandments did include the command to honor the Sabbath. In Exodus chapter 20, we have the commandments of God. And God said and spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord, your God, Yahweh, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Well, why can God tell me what to do? Well, God says, well, because I'm your God and I saved you. That's good enough, huh? It's for me. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children to their third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. 
but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold you guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath, a day of rest. The Hebrew word Shabbat means Sabbath. It means rest. Rest. Doesn't mean rules. <laughs> it means rest. And so he says, but the seventh day is a Shabbat to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work. You or your sons or your daughters, your male servants or your female servants or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the Sabbath day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Americans and British Christians once took their faith seriously as well. This is hard for Westerners to understand since they have been secularized to the degree that they regard the state with more power than their faith. But this was not the case in Jesus' time, nor is it for much of the world even today. For most of the world, the breaking of a religious law is a serious charge. So had Jesus allowed his disciples to sin by permitting them to glean handfuls of grain as they passed through the field? Had they committed a sin? That's the question. That's what the disciples were being challenged. The Pharisees, why? And Jesus, of course, his authority as a rabbi. Look, hey, Jesus, why are they doing what's against the Sabbath? You say you keep the Bible. You say you're, you believe the word of God. Why is your disciples sinning? Number two, the Pharisees are charged with violating the Sabbath themselves. I love to watch this uh, banter. I know it's not really a banter. It's, it's how the Lord Jesus always handles. This is something that has fascinated me since I became a Christian and began to read the Gospels, is how they always challenge Jesus, but Jesus always has an answer. And not in a smart way, but he always recourses back to the Word of God. Jesus replies to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was not made for man. I'm sorry, the, the, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Once again, our Lord builds his case upon Scripture alone, without the addition additional tra uh, traditions of the Pharisees and the scribes. In essence, Jesus was saying to them the same thing he said to Satan earlier in the Gospel of Mark. It is written. Remember when, when Satan tempted him, it is written. Over and over when Jesus is, is uh, confronted, when he is accused, his recourse is always back to the Scriptures, to the Bible. Of course, you can't do that if you don't know the Bible. I mean, we Christians should be able to do that. We, we should debate, if we have to, based upon inspired Scripture, not based upon uh, the writings of philosophers or books or, or popular speakers or politicians or, or TED Talks. or any, I mean, Those things are helpful at times to help our own understanding, but they don't establish the authority of the Bible. The Bible has God's authority. When it speaks, God speaks. And so uh, we only would revert to those things as insight, the ability to help our understanding in processing what God has said. But once again, 
Those things do not interpret God's Word. And they do not hold authority over God's Word. They only can be helpful at times for us. Sometimes they're not helpful. They can lead us astray if we're not careful. It is written. Scripture is our authority. Sola Scriptura. That's why that's right here. It's that that's what this is about. It's about explaining and expounding and preaching the inspired Word of God. It's not about the preacher's jokes or stories or, or illustrations or personality or, or degrees or any of those things. Not that those things are not helpful or important, but this is what really matters, and that is the Holy Scriptures. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Might there have been some wisdom and insight in the writings and traditions of the Pharisees? I'm certain there was. I'm sure there were helpful things in the writings of the rabbis, but it wasn't the Bible. And violating one of their traditions was not equal or tantamount to violating Scripture and the commandments of God. And that's what we have to be careful about. What was happening here? Well, 1 Samuel chapter 21 is the account of when David did this. King David, well, of course, at this time he wasn't king. David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech was Abathar's father. Once again, the, the critics try to find an error in the Bible. And they say, well, Mark says that Abathar was the high priest. And in 1 Samuel, it says that Ahimelech is the high priest. <gasps> There's a contradiction in the Bible. <laughs> well, I don't know that I have all the answers here, but I think there is a clear, quite honestly, easy way to understand this. And that is that number one, Abathar was a grown man when his father, Ahimelech, was the high priest. And if we follow this story, right after David leaves with the sword of Goliath and the bread of the presence, the holy bread that was on the, ta the golden table in the tabernacle, Saul sends in a, a band of his soldiers who massacre all of the priests including the high priest, Ahimelech, Abathar's father. Abimelech grabs the golden ephod and the urnum and the thummim, which are holy instruments to divine the will of God, and flees for his life and makes it to David and therefore becomes the next high priest. So, problem solved. Here again, what's our presupposition? Are we looking for errors or are we looking for truth? God's clear on this stuff. Why are you alone? Ahimelech said, and no one with you. And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. Now David, quite honestly, told a lie. He told a lie. The king was after David's life. He hadn't sent David on a secret mission. Now, why did David do this? Probably to protect the high priests and all of the priests because he did not want to implicate them in his treasonous uh, accusation. Not that David had committed treason. He had not, but he had been accused of it. He says, I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread and whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is the holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the vessels, uh, answered the priests, excuse me, truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave them him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, the presence of God. That's what it meant. It's a kind of offering. Each week, 
there was these loaves of bread that were baked and then brought to a golden table and placed there, one for each tribe of Israel, and in that bread would stay there all week as an offering to God. At the end of the week, fresh bread was made, and the, the show bread or the bread of the presence was then taken the, the previous weeks and distributed to the priests to be eaten uh, for themselves. Okay, and so this was holy bread, and that bread symbolized uh, the believer's and Israel's relationship and fellowship with God as the true God. So this was not common bread. This was not uh, bread that you and I could, uh, would, would normally be able to eat, only the priests. But David takes this bread from the priests, feeds himself and his militia, and flees for his life. So Jesus uses this example. You say, well, how could he do this? Well, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Jesus calls these men back to the text. He says, by what standard, we might ask, by what standard do you believe that my disciples have committed a sin against the Sabbath? By what standard do you charge my disciples with sin? Jesus appeals to a well-known and hotly debated account where David had eaten the bread of God's presence from the tabernacle of God and gave it to the men. It was a crisis. King Saul was seeking David's life. David was fleeing with his band of militia. And Jesus shows through scripture that the Pharisees had lost sight of why God gave the Sabbath. God instituted the Sabbath himself at creation. In six days, he created the world, and on the seventh, he rested. He didn't rest because he needed it. He rested because we need it. God created the world in six days. Do you think God was like, whew, I need a day off? No. God wasn't tired. Creating all things did not tap his energy, his power, his almighty power in any way, shape, or form. He is all powerful. So then why did God rest on the seventh day? Because man is not almighty. Even, even before the fall, man needed rest. And so God set this creation rhythm, this creation pattern. I believe a creation ordinance. And that was to um, uh, work six days and rest on the seventh day. Now, I believe it was assumed from the very beginning, it'd be a little hard to establish this, but I believe it could be established. It was assumed from the beginning that rest, the day of rest, the Sabbath day, was a day not just to sleep longer. Maybe part of it, but it was a day of worship. Part of that rest and revitalization was to rest the body and the spirit. And that spirit was to be rested and revived through the worship of God. This was the day that you brought your offering. This was the day that you worshiped him and rested and showed your trust in him. So well, how does trust in him have anything to do with it? You are, you're not supposed to work. In other words, don't do anything to take care of yourself today other than rest. You trust me for your provision. I think that's a lot of what we do in an offering. That's why I think the offering ought to be part of a worship service, my personal's. Because it, in, what are we saying in an offering? Are we passing the plate? Well, you know, we've got to pay the power bill, and it's hot this summer, so the air conditioning is being run more. And, you know, is that why we pass the plate? No. We pass the plate because God has cared for us this week. He has provided for us. He has given us everything we need. And out of what he has given to us, we recognize it by giving back to him, according to how he has blessed us. And so here Jesus shows, to the, shows the Pharisees um, 
They may have violated your traditions, but they have not violated the commandments of God. God told them, the poor in the Old Testament, that they could glean from the fields. God never said they couldn't do that on the Sabbath. Do you see how easy it is to add to, the work, to, to God's commandments and make things worse? Well, quite honestly, I think it's making things worse. You know, I, I was on a church website not long ago, and I'm not, you know, this is an easy target, but uh, I'll, I, that's so ridiculous. I, I, I think it maybe serves as a good example. I was on a, another church website recently. I don't know why I was there. Um, it was referred to in some way, I think, in my reading, and I thought, well, you know, who is this fellow? And so I went to his church website to kind of see where he was on the, the Baptist spectrum. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and it said over, it had some stuff on his, uh, or their, their church website. I won't say him, but it wasn't just him. It was the whole church. It said, everyone is welcome, but you need to bring, you need to, like, ladies should not wear slacks and, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, this is just so crazy. Um, I, it's just hard for me to understand how we would keep people away from God because of such trivial nonsense. It's adding to the God's word. If God wanted to say that, he didn't need me to say it. He didn't need, need me to, to add that or any other preacher. Um, it's, so you see how we can get sidetracked on the wrong things, and which lead us to wrong conclusions. Lastly, we see, we see first that the disciples were charged with violating the Sabbath, we see that then Jesus turns the, the table on the Pharisees and says, um, excuse me, no, actually you are the ones who have violated the Sabbath and the commandments of God. And how do we know that? Well, lastly, Jesus sums this whole argument up with something that I'm sure infuriated many of the Pharisees, and that is that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Not only did he say man wasn't created to keep a rule, but the Sabbath was created for the good of man. But then he crowns that with, and the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And as we've said before, the Son of Man is a messianic term. And why is Jesus Lord of the Sabbath? Well, number one, he's the creator. He instituted it, and so he, therefore he is in control of it. And so we see that, that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, did the, did the Pharisees understand what Jesus was saying? Probably not. Um, but it doesn't matter because over time, the church... And the Jews began to realize what Jesus was really saying. And I think it's something that uh, many of people in the world today who maybe even attend church, but they've lost sight of the true confession of the church. And that is, Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. J.C. Ryle said this, He is only Lord if he's God. Because God instituted the Sabbath in the creation. So when Jesus says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, he is claiming Godhood, divinity. Not only is he claiming that, but he's also claiming divine creation authority. He is saying, basically, I made it. I made all things. I made this rule. I'm over it all. I'm Lord. And this was the declaration of the early church because they understood. This is why the Apostle Paul says that we should confess that Jesus is Lord. This is why Paul later says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess 
Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You say, well, how does the Father feel about this? God the Father loves it because he loves the Son. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of all. Was Jesus ending the Sabbath observance here? I don't really think so. He would eventually change it, though, in my view, to the first day of the week. Here you have the original creation. The creator, Christ, God, creates the original creation. And he institutes the seventh day as a day of rest and worship. Now the Son of God is raised from the dead on the first day of the week, marking the new creation. And he says, essentially, this is the Sabbath now. That's why I believe that, that I do believe in a Christian Sabbath. Now, let me be very clear about this. I'm not Sabbatarian. Okay? I'm not saying that there's... Now that we're in the New Testament, here's, a whole, here's, a, here's, here's our New Testament Pharisee rules <laughs> for you and me to keep. We can just be guilty of the same thing that the Pharisees were. I'm saying that I believe that Jesus is teaching in the New Testament that as believers, we celebrate Christ's resurrection, his lordship, by gathering and worshiping him on the first day of the week. And that's why we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much more as the day approaches. It's not some rule. See, the Pharisees had missed the point. What's the Sabbath about keeping a bunch of rules? Had God made the Sabbath so that man would have something to keep? Or did God love Adam and Eve and love man and give him something that would be healthy for him? Rest and worship. Does Christ give us the first day of the week as Christians to spoil our fun and our family vacations and our days off? And I'm not saying you shouldn't do any of that, okay? No, he gives us that because he loves us. And we gather, why? Because we love him. If I make you come here or religious leaders or whatever make you come, in some ways you're robbed of the blessing. You come because you love him. And you want to know him. You want to search him. You want to be saved. You, you want your sins forgiven. You want to understand the word of God. You want to pray and, and reach out to him and to have his spirit work in your life. That's why we do it. See, they were all wrong because their premise was wrong. And Jesus corrected that. God, they saw God's motive wrongly and they saw God's position wrongly. Jesus is Lord. That is our confession and that is our belief. Everything we are and trust is in him. Mark has shown us that Jesus is Lord over, over Satan and demons. He is Lord over the sin and sicknesses of man. He is Lord over the call. He is Lord over Caesar and religious officials. He is Lord of the Sabbath. Have you submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ by confessing your sins to him? And believing him for salvation of your souls? I'm not asking you, have you made Jesus Lord? You can't make him Lord. I can't make him Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. What do we do? We bow the knee and confess Jesus is Lord. You see, now we, in this age, we are given the chance, the choice, the opportunity to willingly own him as our Lord, our Savior, our King, our Deliverer. Or we can resist it now. And in the age to come, 
every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those will be made to confess it. Don't be one of those. Be one of those who gladly accepts Christ as the Lord. Where are you in that? Do you know Him as Lord? Have you submitted to His sovereignty? Called out for His salvation? If not, do it. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church.